I'm going to be talking today about some new statistical methods that try to address publication bias and meta-analyses. And they're going to do this specifically by answering a sensitivity analysis type of question, which is how severe would publication bias have to be to explain away the results of my meta-analysis in a way that I'll formalize later. So just as a bird's eye view of what the proposal is going to be, we're going to consider a publication bias process in which statistically significant and positive results are more likely to get published than results that are non-significant or negative by some unknown ratio. Under this framework, we're going to make statements of the following form in our meta-analysis. In order for publication bias to shift my pooled point estimate to the null to completely explain away my results, it would need to be the case that significant positive results were at least, let's say, 30 times more likely to get published than negative or non-significant results. We can then think about whether this type of situa situation is actually plausible or not in assessing the robustness of our findings. So there are a lot of methods out there for publication bias. Why add another one to the mix? So existing methods typically fall into one of two broad categories. First, there are methods that are based on the funnel plot. This includes things like trim and fill, Eggers regression, and the various flavors of peace. Um, and these generally assume that publication bias is really operating on the effect sizes of studies, and also that it doesn't really affect the largest studies. Um, I think the empirical evidence on the way that the publication bias process actually operates suggests that often a more realistic assumption is that publication bias really operates on the significance or lack of significance of p-values, not so much the effect sizes. And so to that end, I think an arguably more realistic class of models is selection models. And these are methods that assume that publication bias does operate on significance and that it affects all studies. So I like selection models a lot. I think they're a very sensible default method, um, but they do have some challenges. So they're likelihood-based methods that typically uh, can be challenging to fit statistically when you have not very many studies, um, even, for instance, fewer than 30, which is kind of the majority of meta-analyses. Um, and they do also typically make parametric assumptions on the effect. So they assume, for instance, normally distributed effects prior to the intro introduction of publication bias. This can be often unverifiable in practice. Um, so before showing you the methods that I'm going to propose today, um, here's an example of a meta-analysis that has been uh, continually uh, controversial with respect to publication bias. So this looked at 75 studies on the effects of playing violent video games on uh, aggressive behavior, and it suggested a pooled correlation of about 0.16 in favor of such an association. Uh, this meta-analysis is about 10 years old and to this day is uh, still kind of being debated with respect to whether the findings are robust to publication bias or whether alternatively they might actually be explained away by publication bias. What I'm going to try to show you today is that I think in some of these scenarios our proposed methods can lead to somewhat clearer conclusions. Critically, the way they do that is by shifting the traditional focus from estimating the severity of publication bias, which is a pretty challenging task, to instead conducting sensitivity analyses. In other words, saying, hypothetically, how severe would publication bias have to be to actually explain away my findings? We're going to see what I mean in a second. All right, so let's get into it. So, um, to formalize the model of publication bias that I stated earlier, we're basically thinking of a world in which there are two types of studies, affirmative studies and non-affirmative. Affirmative studies are ones with significant p-values and positive results, and non-affirmative studies are those with either non-significant results or negative point estimates. And we're considering that these affirmative results are more likely to get published than the non-affirmative results by some unknown ratio. Let's call it eta. OK, so let's visualize this. So this is um, just kind of a toy uh, funnel plot where you see the point estimate of a bunch of simulated studies versus their standard errors. And I've color coded them by whether they're affirmative or not affirmative. This is prior to any publication bias. OK, so now what if I add publication bias to this? Um, essentially, what I've done here is simulated a case with eta as 10. 
So essentially what I'm doing is retaining only 10% of the non-affirmative studies and retaining all of the affirmative ones. Okay. So the analyses I'm gonna show you are designed to get us two different types of statistical metrics. So the first one is telling us the severity of publication bias operationalized in terms of this ratio eta that would be required to shift the pooled point estimate of my meta-analysis to either the null of zero or just some other smaller value. The second metric does the same thing, but instead considers the lower confidence interval limit. So how much bias would it take to shift my confidence interval to include the null? Um, and this is useful in practice because if I write this in my meta-analysis paper, it gives me some sense of whether the amount of bias that's required to explain away my findings is too large to be plausible, indicating robustness, or instead is small enough that it seems like we could actually believe that that's the world we live in. We'll see the interpretation again later as well. All right. So I wish I had time to take us through more of the math. I'm just going to show us a little bit for the case of fixed effects meta-analysis because I do think it's kind of illustrative in terms of the intuition. So a fixed effects meta-analysis is where we're not really trying to account for heterogeneity, but rather all we're doing is essentially taking a inverse variance weighted average of the point estimates in our studies. So what you're seeing up here is just the plain vanilla model where I'm not trying to do anything about publication bias, just inverse variance weighted average. Okay, now if I actually knew what eta was, like say I knew that eta were 10 in practice, it would actually be pretty easy to bias correct this model. I can use an approach that's known in the stats literature and also econ as inverse probability weighting. So what I can do is take the studies that I have in my meta-analysis, the ones I observe, split them into the affirmative studies and the non-affirmative studies, and then refit my estimator while upweighting all of the non-affirmative studies that I observe by a factor of eta, in other words, 10, um, in order to reachieve the balance that I should have had prior to publication bias. Okay, so the intuition is just, if I'm observing a subset of 10% of the non-affirmative studies that I should have seen had there been no publication bias, then to fix that situation, what I should do is take the non-affirmative ones that I see and make each of them count tenfold. Okay? Okay, so that would be great if I knew that eta was 10, but the whole problem is that I just told you it's hard to know what eta is. So what we did instead was uh, we just solved this expression for the value of eta that would be required to shift the pooled point estimate to some other value, or instead it's confidence interval. Um, so I'm not going to show you the actual arithmetic expression, but it's basically, I mean, in, in, in practice what you would do is take uh, quantities that you can estimate from just your standard meta-analysis with your point estimates, you would pop them into that expression and out you would get those two sensitivity parameters. You can also answer a different type of question, which is what if publication bias were actually as bad as possible? What might be a worst case version of my meta-analysis? Well, this actually corresponds to just letting eta go to infinity. Why? Because that's saying, what if I lived in a world where affirmative studies were essentially infinitely more likely to get published than non-affirmative studies? So if I were to take the limit of the expressions I just showed you, what I get is just meta-analyzing only the non-affirmative studies in my meta-analysis and just simply throwing away all of the affirmative ones. Again, why does that make sense? Because essentially, I'm upweighting by a factor of infinity the non-affirmative studies to fix what would be, in principle, maximum publication bias. This can be kind of interesting in practice because sometimes you do this type of worst-case analysis, and what you find is that even the worst-case point estimate under this model of publication bias is actually still something that's a scientifically meaningful effect size. That's a pretty good argument for robustness to publication bias. So I just showed you a toy example for the fixed effects case. Um, in general, with meta-analyses, we want to accommodate heterogeneity, and so we fit random effects models. Um, we've also developed uh, methods that work in that case, so they accommodate heterogeneity. Um, and they also obviate some of the assumptions that have been sort of challenging with existing publication bias methods. So they allow for arbitrarily small meta-analyses with correct uh, inference. Um, they also allow for situations where there's clustering of point estimates. So in other words, if some studies contribute multiple point estimates to the meta-analysis. Um, 
And finally, they're distribution free with respect to the distribution of true effects in the meta-analysis. Um, the mechanics are very similar, and once again, we get that a worst case estimate arises from meta-analyzing only those non-affirmative studies. Okay, so let's go back to the violent video game. So here is um, another funnel plot where I've, again, uh, color-coded these studies by whether they're affirmative or non-affirmative. And I've actually added two things here. So I've added two different point estimates right above the x-axis. So on the right, this black diamond, which it probably is the same color uh, from the back of the room, but the, the diamond on the right is the naive estimate that I would get if I just meta-analyzed all the studies and I didn't try to do anything about publication bias. On the left, um, this blue diamond is actually the worst case estimate. So this is what I would get if I meta-analyze only those blue non-affirmative studies. Now already heuristically, it's sort of interesting because you can see that this, this worst case point estimate is actually still positive. It's definitely smaller than the naive one, but it's actually still positive. So even under maximal publication bias with this model, I still actually get a positive point estimate. That impression is corroborated if I actually do the numerical analyses. So the top table here is the, uh, again, the naive estimate. I'm showing you three different specifications, but I've highlighted and read the one that is uh, sort of the best practice for this particular meta-analysis. So pool correlation of 0.18 and confidence interval bounded above 0.15. The worst case estimate is, is certainly smaller. It's about half as large with a correlation of 0.08. But interestingly, as I showed you before, it's still positive, and in fact, its confidence interval is uh, also bounded above zero. So, uh, so again, even under worst case publication bias, we actually do get a correlation of 0.08. Um, okay, so what if we look at the amount of publication bias required to explain away the effects? So the first two columns here are uh, looking at the amount of publication bias needed to shift the pool point estimate, and then secondly, its lower confidence interval limit to the null. Well, I just told you that even the worst case estimate is greater than zero, so in fact, it's not possible. That's what the not possible is saying in those first two. Um, we might ask a more stringent question. We might say, well, some correlations are kind of too small to care about, so what about shifting the pooled point estimate or its confidence interval to, let's say, a correlation of 0.1 instead of zero? That's what those last two columns are showing you. So what this is saying is that if I wanted to shift my, my observed correlation of 0.18 uh, even to a correlation of 0.1, it would have to be the case that affirmative results were at least 30 times more likely to get published than non-affirmative results. To shift the confidence interval to include 0.1, it would need to be the case that affirmative results were at least four times more likely to get published. Is that plausible or not plausible? Do we think that the paper is robust or not? So uh, this is, I'm trying to summarize a paper in one slide here. So long story short, we did a meta-analysis of meta-analyses across a range of different disciplines and sources um, in which we actually did fit selection models to empirically estimate the selection ratio to benchmark plausibility. Um, so to, to summarize this kind of large endeavor, um, across all of these sources, um, affirmative results were actually only about 20% more likely to get published than non-affirmative results. And interestingly, even looking at sort of the 95th quantile of these selection ratios, it was typically less than four or five. So returning to that violent video games meta-analysis, a selection ratio of 30, which is what we got out of our analysis, is quite large and I would say not really plausible. So we might therefore say that it's fairly robust. Uh, we have an R package called publication bias, so you don't need to actually do the math by hand. Um, and so just in closing, um, what I've tried to show is that sort of by shifting the focus from uh, tr the traditional focus on estimating the severity of publication bias, which is interesting and important, but statistically quite challenging, to instead conducting sensitivity analyses, where we look for the hypothetical amount of publication bias that would be required to explain our way our, our results, we've arrived at what I think are fairly useful um, summary measures to calibrate confidence in meta-analyses. And critically, to have done so in a way that obviates some of the challenging assumptions that are associated with existing methods. Um, there are cases where our assumptions about the mechanisms of publication bias may not hold exactly. We've tried to choose a model that conforms well to empirical evidence on how this works. Um, in the paper, if you want more details, we discuss uh, situations in which our assumptions are either statistically conservative, 
um, or in which uh, our methods can be extended to accommodate other sort of realistic violations of these assumptions. Um, our, affirm our, our methods do require at least some non-affirmative studies to be published. Otherwise, what are you going to upweight in your analysis? Okay, so that is a limitation. Um, and I'll just leave you with this slide of resources. So a preprint, OSF repo, uh, our package, and ways to contact me. Time for maybe one clarifying question. Otherwise, we'll leave um, the longer, more complex questions till the end of the panel. So does anyone have a clarifying one? Um, very interesting uh, concept, although I, I have to say that I have lots of reservations. It's, it's a hybrid between Rosenthal's failsafe, which is like the earliest way to control for publication bias, uh, Trim and Phil, Sue Duvall's about 20 years old. I mean, failsafe is 40 years old. Uh, Sue Duvall's is 20 years old. Both of them have been extensively used and have led to complete misunderstanding about publication bias and meta-analysis. So I, I do worry that what you propose will, will just do the same because in many situations, like in the example that you showed, it's very likely that you will have some implausible numbers and I, I've seen that in the medical literature again and again, people using these techniques when th the numbers are impl implausible so that they conclude that it's impossible for publication bias to do anything. And then you have all these others which you get very small age, but what it means is, is just that the, the, the result is very close to being indistinguishable from the null, which again happens very often. But assuming that the non-published studies will be represented by the, the published, I mean, you know, this is, this is very circular. I mean, it, it, they could be anything. They could be very different from what is published, either affirmative or, or non-affirmative. So I'm, I'm just worried that it will add yet another test to a field that is completely overwhelmed with, with misleading tests. Uh, and I have added some to that misleading literature myself. <laughs> okay, well then we'll get on to the next presentation. Thank you. Can I answer the question? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I thought you were going to. That's <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yes, please, please, please. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple of comments there. So with those existing methods, so what our shares with those existing methods is the focus on sensitivity analysis rather than estimation. But critically, the framework is actually quite different. Um, because rather than, for instance, saying like with the failsafe N, uh, let's imagine that there's some corpus out there of studies with point estimates of zero, exactly zero, for instance. The assumption that we're making is that uh, publication bias selects on significance, and then conditional on significance is not a function of, for instance, the effect size in the study. Um, so they do share the sensitivity analysis focus. They do not share the focus on uh, kind of postulating this corpus of studies with precisely known characteristics. Um, the other part of your question was uh, propagating misleading findings. Yeah. So I think that with any publication bias um, method, it's always critical to try to state what the assumptions are and make sure that we're in a scenario where those tend to hold. So I mean, for instance, uh, many methods don't really work unless effects are homogeneous. Um, what we've tried to do to try to clean up some of this misleading mess that's happened with publication bias is to try to remove some of the assumptions that have been really troublesome so that we're in a scenario where uh, the assumptions we're making are as weak statistically as possible. Um, I think there was a third part to your question as well. So your, your, your basic assumption is that the non-published studies are represented in yes. the published studies, which, which based on what we know empirically, it's never the case. I mean, <laughs> but, but critically conditional on whether it's affirmative or not. So we're, we're not saying that, that, so what we're saying is that once a study is affirmative, um, its publication probability is essentially uh, random with respect to once I'm conditioning on affirmative versus Basically, not affirmative Basically, you're assuming a selection model based on one uh, p-value threshold. So, so whenever we have data that we can test publication bias based on registries, for example, or, or something that we know exactly what has happened, th this has never been the case. Uh, I mean, that there's it's a single far threshold. more complex than that. So in the, yeah, unfortunately, I don't actually have this here, but in uh, this paper, we actually did extensive um, analyses to look at whether a two-tailed versus a one-tailed selection model is appropriate. So uh, for the rest of the audience, um, 
selection based on, for instance, significance in either direction versus in one direction or selection based on multiple p-value thresholds. Um, by and large, it really did look like it was one-tailed selection. Um, and these, these analyses actually can be extended to accommodate multiple p-value um, cutoffs. And furthermore, they actually are statistically conservative in the case of two-tailed selection um, in the sense that two-tailed selection is uh, kind of a, a better scenario to be in with respect to publication bias because you're, you're selecting for studies that are on either side of the null rather than just one. Hi, uh, thanks for inviting the paper. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Adam McCloskey, who is an econometrician at uh, uh, Boulder in Colorado. Um, so here we're trying to propose uh, new critical values for statistical tests in order to correct for uh, publication bias. Um, so the idea is that, of course, um, hypothesis tests are really important in the scientific process. Um, so that's true, of course, if you do applied science, but it's also true if you do theoretical science. So for theorists, you know, uh, this type of tests are really important to figure out whether existing uh, theories and paradigms are uh, valid or not. So for instance, you would take as a null hypothesis that your existing theory is valid, and then you would run an hypothesis test, and then if you can reject that null hypothesis, then you've discovered an anomaly in your existing theory. And, um, and so then that's good, that allows you to um, correct your existing theory to try to make it better, and then as anomalies pile on, you know, as uh, Thomas Kuhn explained, then at some point you're going to throw away your existing theory and you're going to move to a new or pretty better um, theory. So, um, you know, on the theoretical side, this type of tests are really important. For applied science, of course, hypothesis tests are also very important. They allow you to test for the effectiveness of, you know, new medical treatments, new public policies, you know, and there the null hypothesis is that your new treatment doesn't work, and then if you can reject that null, then you found a treatment or you found a policy that actually, actually works. So in both situations, you know, whether you come at it from a theory side or more applied side, you know, you can make a lot of uh, scientific progress if you can reject, you know, your null hypothesis. Um, but of course, for this test to be informative, what's really critical is that, you know, your results don't really uh, rely on chance. So usually there is a nominal significance level that the community agrees on. So usually you call that alpha, it's maybe like 5% or 10% or 1%. Um, and the idea is that you don't want that when you run your test, the probability of a type one error, so the probability that you reject a null hypothesis that's actually true is larger than this significance level. Okay, that's what you want to have tests that are informative. Um, otherwise, you know, you're just going to reject null hypothesis left and right just uh, based on chance. Now, the issue, of course, is that um, because of publication bias, usually uh, the type one error rates are much, well, are larger or much larger than the significance level that the community has agreed on, say 5%. Um, so why is that? Well, it's because first people need to publish, uh, you know, to survive. So you need to publish papers to get a job, to get tenure, to get promoted, to get grants. So it's clear that people have a big incentive to publish. The second element is that journals, they seem to pre prefer to publish significant results. So they seem to prefer to publish rejection of the null hypothesis. Um, here I have a, you know, this is a famous table that shows that uh, aspect of publication. So it's taken from a paper by uh, Sterling, Rosenbaum, and uh, Weinkheim, 1995. So you can see, and it's kind of redoing an analysis that Sterling did in 1959. But so what you can see here is that um, so if you look at the box over there, you can see that psychology journals, they publish 97% uh, here of results that reject the null hypothesis. So most results are significant in the psycho... Well, so that's from the 50s. And then they redid this analysis in the 80s, and you find similar results. So in psychology in the 80s, 95% of um, results were significant. And they did the same in medical journals, and there the number is a bit lower, 85%. But you know, it looks like journals really prefer to publish significant results, uh, you know, which is not very surprising. And so, of course, if you have scientists who want to publish and journals who want significant results, scientists are going to do whatever they can to achieve these significant results. Um, you know, so essentially, people are going to conduct studies until they can reject uh, the null hypothesis. Um, and there is also a lot of evidence of that. So this is another famous figure. Um, that looks at what happens uh, to studies in the social sciences uh, based on the results that they get. And the key finding here 
is what you have in this column that uh, studies in the social science that find null results, so that cannot reject the null hypothesis. The vast majority of them, they never get written up. Okay, so they are not, you know, they are not even working papers and, and they are certainly not uh, published. So it looks like, of course, researchers are aware of, uh, you know, what's happening and they are changing their behavior in response to these incentives um, to publish. So, um, so the problem is that in classical statistics, you don't take this behavior into account. You know, the critical values that you use when you run tests, say 1.96 for a two-sided test with 5% uh, significance level, you assume that the researcher conducts one study and reports the result of that one study. But as, we, as we've seen from that, it's very unlikely that that's the case. So here what we're trying to do is to propose critical values if we do take into account the fact that researchers have incentives to uh, you know, publish papers and journals want to see significant results. So how much or, or how do we have to change critical values in a world like that to account for that uh, behavior? Um, so, um, so here what we're trying to do is to propose critical values that will replace, so if we think about two-sided tests, 5% significance, so we want to replace that 1.96 critical value with something else that will make, you know, that will allow readers, when they read a published result that's significant, it will allow readers to be sure that that result, in fact, you know, doesn't have a type 1 error rate that's larger than 5%. So we'll make sure that that 5%, if that's what the community agrees upon, uh, as a right significance level, that that side 5% is actually enforced in practice. Um, and so, of course, uh, so some people have uh, thought about that for a long time, and you have some papers that say, well, we can just look at what researchers do. So, you know, maybe researchers, you know, on average, they'll publish, uh, they'll do three studies, and they'll publish the best of these three studies. And I say, if we take that into account, we can compute new critical values, and we can maybe use that. Now, the problem with that approach, of course, is that as you change your critical value, the behavior of the researcher is going to change as well. And that's the challenge, is that, you know, you change your critical value, the behavior changes, and then you have to rechange your critical value again. Okay? Um, and so, to be able to address that challenge, what we have to do is to model the researcher's behavior and incorporate that when you compute your critical values. So, that's, uh, that's the goal of this, um, of this paper. Um, so, how do we do that? So we'll have a very simple model of researcher behavior and a simple model of what the journals do. So on the researcher side, we assume that um, researchers are going to conduct possibly many studies. Each study has a cost. So study, you can think of that as, say, running an experiment to study the effect of something. Okay? So your study has a cost. When you run your study, you have some prior uh, belief about uh, you know, the results that you're going to find. And so maybe we can use what Ted talked about. Maybe we can use community surveys to figure out what these prior beliefs are. And then you have some returns to publishing uh, that study. Okay? And these returns, we also have kind of a good sense of what they are. So we know, for instance, that in economics, if you publish in a top journal and you work in the UC system, the present discounted value of that is maybe like $50,000 or just below that. Okay? So we can use stuff like that to try to inform uh, and calibrate our model. And so what the researcher does is that at each step, so when you start with your first study, you know the cost, you have an idea of expected benefit, you're going to conduct that study if your expected benefits are higher than the cost. Then if you get a significant result, you're lucky, then you can send that paper for a publication. If you do not get a significant result, you think about doing a second study. And again, you compare the cost, the benefit, and you decide whether you conduct it or not. Okay? And then you keep on going until either you've published something because you got a significant result, or the cost outweighs the benefits. On the editor side, again, very simple behavior. So the editor will just publish all results that are significant. And of course, you could change that and say, oh, they are going to publish you know, a fixed fraction of results that are significant. And what the editor is trying to do is to pick a critical value, so a threshold for significance, such that in practice, the probability of type 1 error is no greater than the significance level that people agreed on, say maybe 5%. Um, so how do, we, how do we figure out what the Z value is? So what we call an incentive compatible critical value. So a critical value that's compatible with the actual incentives faced by researchers. So there are two steps in computing that. Um, so first you have to figure out what is the maximum number that would be profitable for, re, uh, maximum number of studies that would be profitable for a researcher to conduct. Okay? And this number we'll call it capital N. And so basically, you can do that because 
you know that it's going to be profitable to conduct a study if the expected benefit, which is uh, what we have uh, there, so the value of publication times the probability to cross the critical value, is bigger than your cost. Um, and so depending on the, you know, kind of how people learn when they conduct more study, what is the correlation structure between the studies that you conduct, you can figure out in a given setup what is the maximum number of studies that uh, people would, uh, would conduct. And then we define the incentive compatible critical value as the critical value such that the best result among the maximum number of studies, um, so the probability that that best result crosses the critical value is equal or no larger than alpha, the significance level that we want to enforce. Okay? So basically, we are going to choose a critical value that takes into account the fact that people conduct possibly many studies and the number of studies they conduct depend on the critical value we've chosen. So you can see the critical value shows up here and shows up here. Okay? Um, and so, um, so in practice, you know, you, usually you can't get closed form solution for that, so you have to do some simulations to get a sense of what the critical values are. Um, so, uh, so what do you find with that? Or oh, something I should say, actually, you get some interesting, just looking at that without getting values for the critical value, you get interesting insights. Um, so for instance, what you can see from that is that if you have researchers that have, uh, that have a lot of funding, so that for them, the cost of conducting studies is less. These guys should be held to higher standards, for instance. You can see that here immediately. Uh, so you could imagine that depending on you know, which university you come from, you would have different critical values that are uh, applied to you just because you have different access to uh, you know, resources. The same is true for journals. You could imagine that journals that have you know, higher return to publishing in them, so say in economics, like the top five journals, they should have higher standards just because um, the value of publishing in a top five journal is much higher than the uh, value of publishing in a mid-tier journal, for instance. So you can see that immediately from, uh, from here. Okay, so something else actually that you can see uh, here is that, so you may ask me, how do we know that this critical value here even exists? How do we know that? And actually what's interesting is that in a basic case, the critical value doesn't exist. So if the cost of conducting uh, studies is fixed, if people don't learn, and if all your experiments are uh, IID, you know, they are uncorrelated, actually what you see in that case is that either nobody conducts any study in the field or people would be willing to conduct infinitely many studies. So in fact, what you can see from this model is that in this basic setup, you can never learn anything from hypothesis test. Okay, that's the first result here. Um, and it's obvious because if you conduct a first study, given that the next study would be exactly the same as the current studies, and you know, if you were okay to do one, then you're okay to do two and three and four, and then you're okay to run studies until you reach significance, basically. So in a basic world like that, what you see is that you can never learn anything from hypothesis test. Um, so you have this impossibility result. Um, so how do you break it? When can we actually learn from hypothesis test? Well, there are several things. So one is that if it's more costly to conduct studies, as you conduct more studies and people are going to stop at some point and then you will be able to find an incentive compatible critical value and learn something from test. If people learn as they conduct more studies, same thing at some point people are going to stop conducting studies. Say, you know, you've done 50 studies, you haven't found any effects. You know, if you learn, you're going to realize, okay, there's probably no effect and I'm never going to find it. So in a world like that with learning, people will also stop conducting studies at some point and therefore, you know, you have a well-defined incentive compatible critical values if studies are also um, correlated, so say for instance you, you conduct more studies, but what you do is that you just pull the data that you accumulate. You don't throw away anything. In a world like that with pooling, you have a lot of autocorrelation or a lot of correlation. And at some point, as you add more study to an already big pile of studies, you're not going to you know, change very much what you have and people are going to stop also at some point. In a case like that, you can also learn from a hypothesis test. Okay? Um, and so now in the last uh, two minutes that I have, what I want to show you is just a simple example of how uh, the critical values, how different they can be in a world like this. So I'm going to look at a case in which uh, people pool their data. So think about somebody who does lab experiments. And what they do is that they have a first lab experiment and they may conduct a second one and pool all the data and a third one, pool all the data and stop until they reach significant on the pool data. Okay, so in a world like that, you know, what happens if people are allowed to behave like that? So a uh, first thing you can see here, so here what I'm showing you is the actual uh, rate of type one error uh, 
if we use the standard critical value of 1.96 as a function of the prior belief of the researcher. And what you can see is that um, if people have ex expect a zero effect, then actually you don't really have any issue. So people don't conduct more than one study and your standard critical values work. But as people start to believe that the effects are stronger and stronger, they are going to conduct more and more studies. And you can see that the probability of type 1 error can go up to 10%, 15%, or 20%, although the intended type 1 error rate was 5%. So you have some distortion here. It's not huge, but it's, you know, it's not nothing either. If you want to correct it and use an incentive compatible critical value, you get something like that. So you can see that the incentive, critical, uh, incentive compatible critical value is above 1.96 and goes up to maybe like 2.4 or something like that in a case like this. Um, so here you see it depends a little bit, of course, on the prior belief of the researcher. You can also see how it depends on the cost and benefit of conducting studies. And here what you can see, what's nice is that actually the probability of type 1 error or the incentive uh, compatible critical value is not uh, strongly dependent on what the calibration of the cost of running experiments or the benefits of publication. So here it doesn't depend on it um, too much. And the last thing I wanted to show you is, so how many studies people uh, actually conduct if we let them do that and we use incentive compatible critical values? So you can see if we stick to the standard critical value in a world like this, people will conduct on average four studies. And in fact, so this means that people, on average, they would conduct four experiments and they would pull the results of these four experiments. If we use an incentive compatible critical value, which is a bit higher, at 2.3, people would conduct, on average, about uh, three experiments. But so here, the key difference between this approach and, say, uh, you know, pre-analysis plans or things like that, is that here we let people do whatever they want to do, but we take into account this behavior when we, uh, you know, when we assess significance. Whereas if we're in a world with like pre-analysis plans or things like that, we force people to behave as they should according to classical statistics. You know, we force people to conduct only one study, and in a world like that, we can use standard critical values. So it's kind of a very different approach, but trying to get at the same thing, at making sure that when you see a significant result, it is indeed uh, significant. Are there any quick clarifying questions? Okay, thank you. We'll go on to the, the next one. Um, so Cecilia Mo uh, is our, our the last speaker of the session. Great. Um, I appreciate the invitation to speak to you today. Um, and for those of you who were here yesterday, you got sort of a preview of sort of my main punchline. So I um, appreciate you sort of sticking with me and, and being willing to hear sort of um, all the aspects that went into that punchline. Uh, so this is joint work with Matthew Graham, a graduate student at Yale University, um, Greg Huber, I'm a professor at Yale University, and Neil Malhotra at Stanford, one of the people who uh, I think his, his work on unlocking the foul drawer um, was, uh, was cited in the last presentation. Um, and we have been thinking a lot about how to think through transparent research in the setting of observational data. So I don't think I have to um, try to argue to anyone in this room that there has been this replication crisis that social scientists have been starting to, uh, and natural scientists have been thinking through as to how to resolve to enhance the credibility of the research that we produce. And the proposed solutions have really been focusing on experimental work, right? So this conversation has really started with social psychology, development economics, where the main kind of mode of generating data has really been in randomized experiments. And so in that paradigm, uh, what's been pro proposed are trying to think through replicating experiments and having a pre-registration process, right, where you're putting up a pre-analysis plan that ties the hands of the researchers before actually analyzing that data. Now, given that that focus has been in those domains, um, those of us who are doing work that does not do experimental work, still have this question of, well, how do we think through transparent work when there is no data that can be newly collected, right? So when we're thinking about, in my space, in political science, a lot of really important questions are being asked with data that can't be generated again, right? Elections have already been held. 
conflicts have already occurred. And it's what, when we're trying to observe that reality and wanting to ask, ask some big questions in terms of what, you know, what is, what predicts conflicts, what results in incumbents um, being more like more or less likely to be voted in again? What predicts impeachments? You know, any of these kinds of questions that may be top of mind, it requires that we look at data that has already been generated. But unfortunately, the conversations we've been having have really focused on a, a paradigm that, that provides a lot of lessons, but not exactly everything that we really need. So how do political scientists, and really generally any social scientist that focuses on observational data, how do we think through replications and tests of robustness of that data, right? When we're looking at replications using that data, we've largely seen that um, there's significant modifications that are being made of the replicator after that original research is being generated, right? You're looking at that initial publication that may have come out in a top journal, a well-cited book, and then the replication team or individual is really changing sort of the mechanics of how to get, uh, how to test uh, the hypothesis. And other times people are introducing new cases altogether, right? And when we're thinking about scope conditions, those new cases might not quite be apples to apples when we're, when we're rethinking how, how to answer a specific question. So the problem is with replication, right? Just as in the initial generation process, uh, uh, data generation process, there might be concerns of p-hacking or people being, um, people basically putting null effects in the file drawer and only publishing significant effects. There's concerns around null hacking with replications, right? And so there's been uh, recent work that speaks to this Right, and uh, recently um, they've been called the gotcha bias uh, among political scientists, and a team of economists have called it the overturn bias. Right, so the incentive of the original authors may be to show some kind of novel, splashy result with statistically significant findings. So when we're doing a replication, if you just find that that original research is you know, validated. There's nothing novel or splashy about that. So in terms of the replication, the, the publication of replications, there may be this file drawer problem with replications where the significant effects are in fact just tucked away, right? So we don't know that maybe 200 times, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of faculty here that do say exercises with their graduate students that may involve kind of replication efforts, like looking at sort of the data that was most recently generated and doing things over again, and then they're finding that the original results replicate. None of that gets written up. So maybe we only see that one study that overturned that highly cited work, and then we have this concern that, okay, so there's one finding that says there's a true result, and another finding that says it's a false result. And then so we have these two studies to go off of when in reality maybe there were 90 studies, 100 studies or more that actually uh, validated that original result. So this concern of null hacking comes into play as it relates to replication efforts. And I think this is not just limited to observational work, right? This is probably something that also is worrisome um, for, uh, for experimental, experimental work unless there's this concerted effort that we're going to sort of publish all the replications. So this is the problem that we're trying to sort out um, with, with our current project. So in sort of thinking through how to resolve some of these issues, we proposed five different features. Now this, these features are not going to be um, like exhaustive, right? There, there are things that I think that we're still trying to think through as, a, as, as we implemented our approach, we found some limitations, but wanted to share at least five features that we think could be helpful. So first, this is unique for observational data, right? Like I said, history can't occur again, but what we can leverage is the passage of time. Right, so more elections will be held, more conflicts unfortunately will occur, and so we can leverage the passage of time as we're thinking of new data that can speak to an, a study that has already occurred. Right? And so we call this sort of adding out of sample observations, where depending on how much time has passed, you can maybe run the analyses again on just the new data or on the full data set. And presumably, with the passage of time, with more data, we're going to have um, more precise estimates, right? And if there are, if that original result was a false positive, then adding observational, adding additional observations to, will will help resolve some of that. 
And so we call this sort of the analog of replicating an experimental protocol with a new sample. The second bit that we found to be something that um, surprisingly was more important than we had initially thought was the process of independently collecting all of the data as opposed to simply downloading things from Dataverse or other um, websites like of the original authors that are trying to be transparent with their process. And we find that that is important, especially with observational data, when we're taking, say, some raw data, whether it's provided by the census, um, some FEC, or so forth, is that there may have been some corrections in the raw data itself um, that we're not going to appropriately leverage if you're simply downloading. And additionally, with a lot of observational work, you are merging data sets together. And in that merge process, there's a lot of human error that can come into play. And we, just with our approach that um, I'll show you with the example that we had, in that we discovered two big issues with the three papers that we were looking at, one of which was mine, right? And it was seeing that there were some issues with the raw data for one and another one that there was um, a, a, a standardization issue that the authors purported to do but didn't actually do when we looked at the do file, right? This is not sort of malintent or sort of a fraudulent practice. It's just the fact that when you are having a cleaning file that is maybe thousands of lines long sometimes, that there can be mistakes that are done. So this process of just getting the new data from scratch and redoing everything that the authors um, proposed that they did or reported that they did could be a helpful process of just cleaning things up to ensure that there isn't some mistake that's really driving the finding. Third, we find that the value of pre-registration that, um, um, that experimental researchers have argued for is also valuable as it relates to observational work because of concerns of null hacking, especially with replications, right? So when we are having replicating teams potentially looking for specifications that might just kind of have your, have that statistical significant result go away. Or if you're sort of proposing, like let's just look at, you know, hundreds of different kinds of specifications and see the range, that's also not always appropriate because there's a theoretical reason for why some specifications are better than others, inclusion or exclusion of certain fixed effects and so forth. And then finally, if a literature is robust enough, we think that there's value in doing multiple simultaneous replications of studies um, that advance a single theory, right? So there's been tons within my, my field, studies of uh, what drives sort of a, a vote bump for an incumbent candidate or party, right? So when there's a lot of different studies that are asking similar questions, then there's value in looking at them together and not just testing and replicating one, because then we can sort of see, like if we look at the set, are we maybe replicating 90% of them and only one falls apart? That is very different from all of them kind of falling, um, being very fragile results when we're looking under the hood. And finally, uh, we think that there's value in collaborations with mixed incentives, right? So as I said, that the original authors might have this incentive to p-hack. Replicating individuals or teams may have an incentive to null hack. So if you combine groups with mixed incentives and have them all sort of commit with a pre-analysis plan that this is sort of the process that we're going to follow a report on that, it sort of ties everyone's hands and it allows sort of everyone to sort of be online and it, it creates a more um, credible process. Um, and in, that com in, that, in the process of doing the collaboration, I think it also addresses the concern or helps address the concern that a pre-analysis plan is being generated when the data is already in existence, right? Because people may be concerned, well, how do we know that you didn't actually look under the hood before you like wrote this pre-analysis plan? And having a team of individuals helps sort of with that commitment of, no, we can all attest to the fact that the pre-analysis plan was written before we, we implemented our replication procedure. All right, so in doing this and trying to assess whether or not this approach is helpful, we applied it to a literature in political science around irrelevant events affecting voting behavior, right? So there's this theory that, you know, voters are informed and when they're going to the ballot box that they're only using relevant information to determine whether or not they're going to vote for the incumbent party or incumbent candidate or not, right? And if the reality is that people are just using a lot of information that has nothing to do with government, 
it provides some concerns around how the voting process is, um, is translating to a true democratic process where the will of the people um, is, uh, is reflected in the people who represent us, right? So there's this question around whether or not you know, people are, like voters are rational or not. And when we look at this literature, there are three highly cited papers. Uh, one of which is mine uh, with Neil Malkultra and Andrew Healy that looked at college football games to see whether or not games right before an election had any effect on outcomes. And we hear sometimes politicians speak to this going like, our football team won, and that's why I got, the, I got that bump. I think most recent, re uh, recently that, um, that was something that the uh, governor in Louisiana noted with the LSU win, right? So we were leveraging football games right before an election to see if that translated to any kind of bump for the incumbent party um, or, 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 um, or politician. And then there are two studies that were looking at natural disasters. Um, and they sort of similarly noting that like if you see a flood or a, a, or a tornado right before, that that translates to a hit um, for the incumbent party or candidate. And unfortunately, findings are a bit of a mess, right? The result, the reason is since those three articles, there have been lots of back and forth and a lot of other kinds of studies trying to look at this, some with better data than others. Um, most recently, Fowler and Hall and Fowler and Montañez, they've tried to say like, actually the college football result is a spurious finding, right? And so there's been back and forth conversations. And then there's other studies that have said like, well, sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't. Right, so then now if we take this full body together, what are we supposed to make of it, right? So it's, it's resulted in a confused uh, conversation. Um, and then there's been other studies that have spoken to, like, well, maybe we need to interpret these results differently. So we were trying to then look at just the three most top-sided studies in the literature that speak to irrelevant events mattering, right? And as I said, the implication of this is trying to really think about whether or not elections are a good mechanism for democratic accountability. And while this is observational data, right, this was, there was no experiment that took place right before elections, right, the assumption was that it's, those events are random, random conditional and expectations, and then you could also have some theories around heterogeneous effects of when would you expect to see results being bigger. And in the case of college football games, it's that if it's sort of a, a high-performing team, sort of think about South Bend, Indiana, versus Berkeley, California, right, in terms of whether or not the football results matter more. So we can leverage things like that. Um, with droughts and floods, rural areas might have a really different reaction versus urban areas. Um, and tornadoes, there's also this thing called a disaster declaration, where then, you know, the government sort of can sort of come in and say, like, we acknowledge that there's a disaster, and now we're going to flood, flood you with some resources to help you, right? So they, they can um, also provide some government assistance. So we basically found the main tables in each of these three studies. So this was from Aiken and Bartels. This is from our college football paper. This is from the, uh, the tornado paper. And the dimensions of our, um, of our reassessment, right, we try to do the exact replications with that light touch, right? Just if we do everything as the original authors did with out of sample data, what happens? Um, we also try to broaden election types if it was possible because in some cases, they only look, people looked at presidents, others only looked at governors, others only looked at senators, so what happens if we just look at everything together? Um, and did those various heterogeneity tests I just described, and also looked at some idiosyncratic features that each of the original authors did, just to try to be as honest to what um, the original authors did. And then given that proposal of trying to redo data collection and redo all of the coding from scratch, right, we tried to improve the data when possible. Um, the goal was to check robustness without null hacking, right? And then we did sort of the things that we wanted, to, that we, we felt were important for this approach, the pre-registration, um, applying consistent rules, and trying to interrogate measurement choices without really changing um, the sample or variables. So given that there isn't time to go through all three, I'll just show you with what happened with the college football. Um, so the original result had a 1.61 finding. When we replicated the data, right, so we basically did everything again with the same, same set, right? This is supposed to be exactly identical. We should have produced that 1.61 again. I mean, the original authors were part of the team. But the process of redoing the data cleaning and the fact that raw data got better 
that 1.61 became 1.13, right? So the effect size has changed. Still statistically meaningful. Then we added the out of sample data, right? 2006 was our cut cutoff last time. 2016 was our new cutoff. Changed marginally, 1.09, but not too much. So the effects remain robust, right? So the pool result I'll say focus on because we were looking at sort of the two games two weeks before, but the pool results um, are, are sort of the main finding um, that was important to us. Now with heterogen, uh, the heterogene, uh, heterogeneous treatment effects, before we found that high attendance teams like South Bend had much higher effects than say at Berkeley, California. We still see some of that, but whereas before it was statistically meaningful, it was no longer statistically meaningful. So the heterogeneous treatment effects were no longer as sort of conclusive as we had initially thought. And when we added the out of sample data, it didn't change very much, if anything, sort of the difference between the high impact team locations versus low impact teams shrank, right? So some things that were good, some things that were not good. Um, and then when we did respecifications for the sort of the ideal respecification across the multiple studies that we're looking at, uh, the effect sizes remain sort of similar, 1.10, 1.05. 1.10 with the original test years and then 1.05 for the expanded test years. So at least the main result seemed to be stable, but there were some other features that were part of the original study that made it a slam dunk, less of a slam dunk. And so, just summarized all of those things. So what we generally found was the college football study generally replicated. The two studies I didn't show, they were more mixed, right? And at least in the case of the Healy Malhotra study, right? Notice that Neil Malhotra was part of the team. He noted we made an error. So the original result was actually wrong. Right, and so that was why we found that sort of that original date, sort of like redoing the data coding and the raw data bit was actually quite important. Um, so we have mixed results. I know I said the findings were a mess. It seems to be that the findings still remain a mess, but I think there was something that was illuminating. In terms of truly random events, we sort of think that maybe college football is actually a lot more random than natural disasters, especially when we're thinking about climate change and all of those other conversations, really shifting our conversation on what natural disasters are really, like should government actually have any influence on natural disasters? The conclusion is now increasingly yes. So maybe the mixedness really has to do with the fact that the, um, the irrelevant events bit is actually better capture with college football than with natural disasters. But the other point is, with all of the studies that we did, we could have actually easily null hacked all of the effects away. Right? So we found with each, each time, we could have kind of focused on the statistically significant result, or we could have found just focused on the null effect result and made a case for it. And so that was a problem that was a problem and sort of shows that we do really need to be thoughtful as we think through replications because we could have easily done all of those, null hacking or p hacking, had we not tied our hands. So thank you. Okay, we have time for one clarifying question or we can just go to the panel. Um, thank you, that's very interesting. Um, so I think if I was reading the upper right-hand corner of your graph correctly, is it correct to say that uh, sort of the biggest hit to the original point estimate was just in you actually redoing exactly what they did from, was it 1.6 to 1.1? Yeah. Are these like risk ratios or something like a, a ratio measure? Uh, so these are like, what, how should we interpret this? What's the effect size measure here? Uh, so this is a win translating to a, this is a 1.13 percentage point bump oh, with the incumbent party or incumbent candidate. So it's saying that a win, and this is uh, symmetric, so if it's a loss, it would be a 1.13 percentage point drop in vote share for the incumbent party or incumbent candidate. I see. So yeah. what, what was the mistake that was made in the original analysis that was yeah, that so large? Yeah, so the raw data um, for the expectations. So what the original authors, includes me, did was we leveraged um, uh, betting, uh, betting data on whether or not it looked like the game would be a win or a loss to be able to account for expectations, right, game expectations. And we found that before the raw data had zero when it should have been a missing. 
And so we interpreted zero as a real zero when in fact it should have been coded as a missing case. Mm -hmm. And so it reflected sort of some of the observations actually dropping out that used to be included. And then there was also one issue as it related to boundary shifts of, of, of counties that change it, changed kind of like which, whether or not they were part of the data set versus not. So there were some boundary concerns that needed to be addressed. Um, so those two things were causing the 1.6 to drop to 1.13. Thank you. Um, great talks. I, I wanted to um, go back to Maya's talk and compliment her on such a clear presentation. It was really, uh, really great. Um, I was wondering about the ADA term. It seems so important to understand. I mean, that's why you focused on it. Like, what is, what is a meaningful degree of publication bias? There is some new work. Uh, some of it was presented here last year at the BITS annual meeting um, by Andrews and Casey. Uh, and maybe you're familiar with it. I mean, they're, they're also trying to be kind of non-parametric. But they do come up with these ADA estimates where they take advantage of these large-scale replications in both psychology and experimental economics where they assume that the replication estimates reflect the true distribution and kind of use that to get a sense of what the ADA looks like. And so I, I think you know, most of your estimates on the degree of publication bias, I think there was one line of social science, but most came from biomedical science. And that publication process could be quite different. But I think for the at least the psychology and experimental economics estimates, they found some pretty large ADAs. So just uh, it could be very field specific. Um, and. Uh, so they did find some ADAs of three, some ADAs of ten. So that it seems like maybe there's there's more publication bias in the social sciences than than biosciences. So I just wanted to point you towards that because it seems so important for interpretation of your findings. Yeah, no, I, I love that question. That's actually one of my favorite papers on publication bias. I think it's really, really, really well done. Um, and actually, just to tell a, a personal story about this, so so uh, my co-author and I thought we were going to see ADAs of ten, twenty, thirty when we did this assessment. And actually, uh, so when I kind of came up with the initial estimates, I covered up the forest plot and gave it to my co-author and said, guess what the ADAs are going to be. And he was off by like an order of magnitude, as was I. And it was largely because of that paper. Um, and we actually looked into it a lot, because we, we looked specifically at, for instance, meta-analyses only within top social science journals and within the social science discipline of PLOS One. We still didn't get very large ADAs. They were still an order of magnitude smaller than those in Andrews and Casey. Um, and I think what's going on, we did follow up analyses looking at some other corpuses of p-values, for instance. And I think what's going on is that the mere act of doing a meta-analysis where you're incorporating findings that were not sort of the headline result of a paper, but rather were reported somewhere else in the paper or that you got, for instance, by contacting the authors, the mere act of doing that meta-analysis seems to mitigate some of the publication bias. Because in contrast with the Anders and Casey paper, they were looking at essentially publication bias in like the findings that ended up in the RPP study, which were sort of the key headline finding of each paper. So across the board, what we saw from looking at external corpuses is that it, it really seems like it's those kind of prioritized findings that end up in the abstract or that end up being replicated that have the most severe publication bias. Um, it actually has less to do, it seems, with journal tier even. So I, I was very surprised. I mean, those findings really shocked me, actually. Hi, uh, my name is Devi Prasad, and I'm from the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, or 3IE. And uh, my question is actually for you, Dr. Mo. Um, so we do a lot of replications at 3IE, and one uh, something we've been trying to understand is where are the limitations of going for alternative estimation strategies when we do our um, testing for robustness of findings. And specifically, we're thinking about because there are some arguments on whether or not when you're collecting data for a primary research question that you shouldn't really be applying alternative estimation strategies that might be outside that discipline. Um, and so we're wondering, like, do you have any thoughts on what the limits are, or any of the panelists, of using alternative estimation strategies and when, like, kind of what we should be thinking about when we're taking those into consideration? I know that's a great question. Um, part of, I think, the value of having this team process where we included sort of the original authors um, and then for the original authors of papers that were not included, right, um, so Chris Aiken, Larry Bartels, Andrew Healy were also authors, we did verify things with them. We also went to Fowler and Hall and Andrews and also had a conversation with the team of individuals that actually said that the original study was a spurious finding. And so in generating the pre-analysis plan, it was this process of actually, you know, it felt quite political, sort of like going and kind of doing the diplomatic process of like, what do you think about this? 
what do you think like now when you look sort of back with what we know now, would you have run a different specification? With the things that we do, we know now with the data, would you have run a different specification? With the kinds of data that are maybe now available, maybe that wasn't available sort of 10 years ago when you did this, should that be included or, or not? Um, and so there was a sort of art to it, but I think the series of having conversations with individuals with mixed incentives um, for seeing something, a finding being undermined, seeing a finding kind of live through, um, really was a great way of then finding that respecification that could work. But we do think it was very important that we kind of kept with the original specification too when we're re-examining things because there was value in sort of showing that like in that example, that 1.6 went down to 1.13, and that had nothing to do with anything other than correcting data or maybe correcting a coding issue that went into the, the analysis that was, that, you know, was reported on originally. Um, so in doing this process, we found that there's real value in redoing things exactly the same, and then also try to propose maybe a different kinds of specification that a team of, or specifications that a group of thoughtful individuals could sort of say like these seem to be sort of the best things that we should look at to maybe get lower upper bounds on what these effects should look like. Hi, th thank you. Uh, my question, uh, uh, my name is Fernando Oses, I work at BITS, um, and my question is also for Cecilia mm -hmm. um, very interesting presentation. I, I really like your list of uh, five uh, basically uh, um, prescriptions or ideas to um, improve uh, the transparency observational work. Um, I was wondering, some, some of those uh, go in the similar direction of this idea of a specification curve. I don't know if you have heard of that. Um, uh, so if you could um, uh, give me your thoughts on, on uh, why not go full on the specification curve, what, what are the main challenges, mm -hmm. uh, I would love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, um, so we, we thought a lot about like, well, what kinds of specific specifications should we include, right? Like do we, um, so the one piece with Fowler, like they did something more along those lines and then like saw the sort of like range of like, well, if you do this, you should get like negative or null effects. And if you do this, you can get positive, but like, so in showing that sort of range, there was then this note like then these, the original result is likely a spurious finding. Um, we then, speaking with other original authors, it was sort of thinking really about like how the data generation process really works. What does including a fixed effect or not mean? What controls make sense to include or not include? in light of how sort of the political process unravels, like what kind of information should matter because there's a lot of things that sort of, that we've known already in terms of what matters for vote choice. And so it seemed like it was also a problem to not really think thoughtfully about the fact that certain things are supposed to matter and we know this and, and give equal weight to specifications that, that aren't reflective of the things that we've already learned. Um, and so I think while we could do that, and I don't think it's a problem to you know, do that exercise, it seems like it's still very important to think about what specification should actually be the right one here, right, in light, or like maybe there's a set of specifications. So the college football case, we realize that there is one fixed effect that would be right to include. What happens though is, is if we include that, 90% of the variation goes away, right? And so of course you're going to find a null effect because 90% of the variation goes away. And so then the question is, should we include that? Should we not include that? And if we should include it, then maybe it just means that we have to wait more and more years to, do, to really reassess whether or not this is a true finding. Um, because that's a, that one fixed effect we felt was a more thoughtful thing to include in a specification, but in doing so, then all of the variation goes away, and then ergo, then we get a null effect because of that, and then the question sort of remains, is it just that we need more data? Um, and so I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but it, uh, the, the conversations we had were illuminating. Um, Larry Bartels and Chris Aiken also had very, um, very strong opinions about what specifications were right because of what they knew about po political science, right? And so, 
all, all three presentations were excellent, so I'll, I'll, I'll just try to come up with a couple of uh, <laughs> questions only. But um, I, I really love the, the observational open science uh, presentation. I'm trying to, um, to correlate what you suggested about having this pre-registration plan and, and running through an analysis that is uh, very transparent and trying to revisit a question as compared to what is happening in biomedicine and natural sciences where we have a tremendous problem with observational data. We, we have several millions of papers mm. with, uh, with observational data. Um, currently, we have um, probably over 100,000, I think, uh, mm. studies that are pre-registered, or, or, or I should say registered. <laughs> but if, if you look closely, most of them are not pre-registered. Mm. Um, so em empirically, we have mm. tagged some fields pretty densely. And in, in cancer epidemiology, for example, register studies about 90% of the time, they're registered after the study is done or even after the study is published. Yeah. Um, and and I, I have been a very strong supporter of this sort of pre-registration, but there is a lot of pushback. And to some extent, maybe some of the pushback is fair. Why? Because can you really pre-register an observational analysis, mm -hmm. especially with data that are available uh, to several people? They, they have been collected, or even worse, they're being collected or, or continuously being updated. Mm -hmm. in, in medicine, we have some data sets that have led to more than 3,000 publications each. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, each time it's a little different, mm -hmm. uh, but basically it's one data set that is a gold mine being reassessed and reassessed and and can you ever hope to have sincere honest mm -hmm. pre pre registration on this uh, i mean wh what is the exact boundaries of what is pre registered and wh and what would uh, would really be acceptable to to the field also mm -hmm. and I, I i also think that much of what you you show might be a winner's curse phenomenon i mean if if you if you have some observational analysis that you th that you pursue and, and then something gets published because it attracted attention, it seemed to be very interesting. Uh, on average, you expect if you revisit the question, mm -hmm. some of the effect will go away. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if the early answer is based on an underpowered environment, mm -hmm. it will probably uh, go away almost completely. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one more uh, uh, question uh, regarding the um, the model for publication bias. Um, have you tested how sensitive it is to he genuine heterogeneity? Because this is really where most of the other publication uh, bias models break. You know, in, in the presence of heterogeneity, and uh, we know that they give false signals just by by default. And I, I worry that in the social sciences, heterogeneity is probably, uh, on average, and, and we have some empirical data on that, uh, higher compared to most of other fields. In, in, in fact, um, when we looked at about 300 or 400 meta-analysis in each scientific field across 22 major fields, the highest level of heterogeneity, but also the highest frequency of signals of publication bias, we, which are weak signals, you know, it's all these tests that we have that I believe are, are horrible, <laughs> um, were in social sciences. It, it, it was pretty high in medicine, not as high, but pretty high, a bit less in biology, pretty nothing in, in, in physics or, or natural sciences. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I agree that heterogeneity has been a real challenge for many existing methods. Um, so the random effect specification that I didn't actually show but had just one slide on does directly accommodate heterogeneity. Um, it's essentially like a generalized estimating equations type framework that is a semi-parametric specification. So uh, distribution free with respect to the true effects um, and essentially uses like a sandwich type estimator to accommodate heterogeneity. Um, we've also done an extensive simulation study that considers uh, varying amounts of heterogeneity and different true effect distributions, and it, as, as it should theoretically, it holds up well. Um, so that's all in the preprint if you'd like to see the details. Right. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, so with, I think there are some challenges with observational data um, with, so maybe the initial results first to say the replication, right? So at least with the replication process, we have a lot of insights from the original authors, and so like to the extent that the the publications that are out there are all the sort of the winners from like the, they're basically the, the winners that just sort of happened to find it and were lucky enough to find something and, and get it out there. Um, at least with replications, like we do have some insight in terms of well, what the data is supposed to look like, and 
to the extent that you sort of buy that sort of the new data that sort of comes into reality can be sort of the analog of new sort of collecting the data again. Um, and that having that additional data is going to reduce some of the noise. Um, then we could at least sort of pre-register that. I think sort of the conversation should be split on how do you re how do you pre-register sort of that initial observational study, right? When maybe sometimes you have to sort of look at the data to kind of figure out what's in the data, and then maybe you do know a lot about the data. Um, what we tried to at least do with our approach was we looked at the data because we needed to know what years were available. We needed to know what sort of existed. Um, but, but we didn't merge the data and run the analysis until the pre-registration was done, right? And so when we were sharing this with other folks, they still didn't fully buy it and said like, well, maybe what you need to do is like pre-register this and then say that you're going to do it again in 10 years. Oh. Um, and that brought forth like, okay, well, one, one thing that could be of value is like if we do agree that there are some of these big core questions that can only be answered with observa observational data and this data is going to continue to be generated. Maybe we program in something that like every time the election occurs, it's sort of the effect size like just changes and we can sort of track it with each year that we can just pre-program these things in because we're pre-registering like what's going to happen with like every new election coming through and maybe that's something that we can do as we're thinking about replicating really high impact observational studies um, that we can sort of program this thing that like automatically will update after another conflict occurs or after another election occurs or so forth. Um, but at least for now, as we said, like, well, I don't know if we should not publish this for 10 years because you don't believe us that we pre-registered. Um, another value to the uh, having a team doing this is that we sort of kind of, we attest it, right? So like, like we're putting our reputation on the line and we can say with good faith that our other collaborators similarly did not look at this data. Um, and with really any kind of pre-registration, whether it's experiments or anything, there is an element of trust and faith that we have to have with the original scholars that they're, they're, they did what they said that they were going to do. Obviously, if they're registering after the paper's already been written, that, that does seem off, so maybe we need to think about norms about when these things should be written. Um, but at least sort of this team, uh, kind of the value of the team we found was also in this way that we can kind of self-police one another, even if it's maybe not necessary, but in the times in which it is necessary, that that does take place. Um, and that when there's teams, that it's truly a team. We had the scandal in political science where we found that a graduate student who was collaborating with very senior scholars created fake data, right? And it was a team, but the, uh, the senior advisors didn't actually look at what this graduate student was doing. And it wasn't until he got a job at Princeton and then people were really interested in his finding that they realized there was no data. He was very smart at like creating a result and, he was able to pull through this lie all the way through getting a job at Princeton. And, um, and so having a true team where it's not just like a team of 10 for the sake of 10, but like having people that are actually actively looking at the data together. Um, Matthew Graham was our graduate student. He did the initial pull, but all three of us took time to like really look at everything over again so that we could all say with full faith that we're putting our reputation on the line that we looked at this and to our best knowledge, you know, we followed, we followed the pre-registration and everything that was written in the paper, whenever we deviated, was well documented. Mentioned at least twice this morning. <laughs> Once when we heard about uh, Ted's study of trying to uh, elicit uh, prior distributions of economists, but once you let that in out of the box, you better understand that bias is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. And the issue isn't whether there is bias, but whether the bias is appropriate to the prior distribution that you have. My own view is that uh, realistically, we all have infinite dimensional pri uh, parameter spaces. And we couldn't draw conclusions in a non-experimental setting. You couldn't draw any conclusions without concentrating our limited data resources on the parameters that we think of as most interesting and most important, that's bias. So the issue isn't bias, the issue is the non-transparency of the bias and the interpretation of what the results are. Uh, with regard to the, your uh, <coughs> proposal to do this uh, apparently uh, Bayesian study using a, a prior, uh, 
I, I uh, built my career on the idea no one would ever do that because you can't actually commit to a prior. And as a consequence, you have to do a sensitivity analysis. And I have a lot of results that show uh, how the Bayes posteriors are sensitive or not sensitive. And I tried to introduce words into econometrics, sturdy and fragile. Or <coughs> another comment I've made for a long time is my big contribution to econometrics is confusion. So <coughs> meaning that uh, fragile results. And as I was listening to our second speaker, I um, couldn't help but be remembered of, of uh, 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 McCloskey and Zilliak talking about the cult of statistical significance. Whose, uh, the title is The Cult of Statistical Significance, How the Standard Error Costs Us Jobs, Justice, and Lives. So the, the premise of that book isn't about publication bias, it's the fact that our hypotheses have zero probabilities at least in the area of economics, presumably political science too. Nobody thinks that football doesn't matter. The question is whether it's so small that it can be uh, regarded as irrelevant. So, so we, the, the uh, prior distribution that we saw in that paper didn't have an atom of mass at zero. So there's absolutely no interest in the hypothesis of a zero effect. The significance would come down to one question, is whether the data make a material change in your prior distribution. And on that score, I, I think uh, rather than complaining about public uh, publication bias, what's needed is a kind of optimal publication bias suited to the priors that the analysts have and making sure that the most important things, the things that are gonna meet, move the needle actually get published. Everything's not gonna get published. Um, <clears throat> So I guess that's, that's my comment. More bays, please. And more standard errors and fewer uh, significance levels. Does anyone want to respond to that or? Um, perhaps I'll add the caveat that, I, I mean, I think Bayesian methods are great, but I think there's also a, I think the issue is dichotomization of thresholds. I mean, one can also take Bayes factors and say, uh, as soon as the base factor surpasses four, then it's, uh, it's meaningful and that has really the same issues as dichotomous alpha thresholds. So, I mean, I think there are wonderful things to be said about Bayesian methods, but I, I don't think that taken alone, they're a panacea for publication bias issues. 